G'day lovelies, welcome. All right, today I'm gonna to talk about my journey with parenthood. I wanted to show you what I got for Chrissy and I wanted you to understand how special it really was and I thought the only way I could do that is take you back through my life as a parent. So I have two sons, Harley is 32 and Rusty turns 19 next week. So yeah, they're 13 years apart. So what I'm going to do is that I sort of wrote out the basics to try and remind myself of, you know, my little life story. And as I was doing that, as usual, there's always stories off the side of those stories. So what I thought I might do is turn those little stories off the side of the stories first and then take you through the little story. So let's start with babies, all right? So I was 17 when I had Harley and obviously I was very loud and run amok. Now, at the time, my partner, Harley's dad, had a Harley, and so did a couple of his mates. And they would rock up at like 3 o'clock in the morning, and the whole house would be shaking. And yet, Harley, as a newborn baby, never woke up to it, because he was used to it straight away. Like, oh, vacuum while he was asleep, music would be on, doing dishes, you know, slapping around, cooking, doing whatever I was. And honestly, the only time he used to really wake up is if it was too quiet. Now, fast forward 13 years, and I have Rusty, for some reason, different partner, we decided that quiet was the best option, and Rusty didn't sleep anyway. Uh, Harley ended up being a pretty good baby, but Rusty did not sleep at all. So we would end up like walking around on eggshells, you know, we'd be sitting on the lounge, and we'd open a chip packet as quiet as we could, and you know, got a chip out without trying to make a noise, and as soon as it crinkled, it'd be like, Wah! <laughs> so from experience, from doing it both ways, looking back now, if you've got a newborn baby, be loud. Just be loud, the baby will get used to it within a couple of weeks. Um, that way, you know, you drop something, it, she or he won't wake up straight away. Like they totally get used to the noise and it's really good for them as well. So yeah, be loud and live a little. Now, let's talk about no sleep and you as a couple. So, for me, it lasted six months after one of them, and the other one was about two years before we split. So, looking back on all of that now, if I was to know now, if I was to know then what I do now, what I would have done different is that I would have talked to my partner and said that, I mean, lack of sleep, turns everyone nuts. I remember I used to walk off sometimes and go, who the fuck are you woman? Like, do you know what I mean? I was like, off my head half the time. And it's it's a really horrible thing. But if I was mature enough back then, and you know, look, like I said, looking back now, I probably would have talked to my partner and said, look, every time we get full on with each other and start going off, and let's face it, it's for no reason at all. It's just because you, you just go nuts without proper sleep. So yeah, if I could, I'd go back and say, you know, if we're both going off and it's really over nothing, like at all, we need to say, put it in the box, right? In other words, the sleep deprived box. If one of you or both of you can do that and stop that argument elevating and saying bad things to each other that you can never take back and they're all notches in the, in the belt towards the end, right? So to try and avoid doing that, if you've got some sort of code words with each other, like put it in the box, so one of you's going nuts, the other one can be like, put it in the box, and whether you've got to, um, you know, walk out and go and calm down somewhere or not, or whether you just keep going on with what you're doing and, and chill the F out, do you know what I mean? So if you can have some sort of a, a code word with your partner, that when things are getting out of control for no reason at all, it's, it's a sleep box, it's all about the sleep. So that's my little, that's the only thing I can really suggest about that. Apart from that, both of mine failed not long after because I was absolutely, literally hopeless without sleep. And um, I'm one of those that if I've got to do it on my own, I'll just do it myself, you know what I mean? So maybe definitely give your partner a hand too. <laughs> All right, now let's talk about sex and having kids in the house, shall we? Oh. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I've actually got three, three stories that really stick out to me. The first one that comes to mind, <laughs> 
Harley was about 18 or 19 years old. Um, I've had my own house, my partner had his own house, and this one night we got absolutely smashed, and we decided to go back to my house because he had kids the same age as, as mine, 18, 19 year olds, living at home as well. So we decided this night we'll go back to mine. So anyway, obviously, Paro had run the mark, sat outside drinking for a while, went in the bedroom, did, did what we always do, you know, run a mark. Anyway, the next morning I get up and I walk outside and there's Harley getting out of his car with his pillow and quilt. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, I slept in the car last night. I said, what the fuck for? And he goes, well, what do you reckon? I was like, oh, <laughs> Like, you know, I, I was oh, 38 maybe by then or something like that. I don't know, you're like 36 or something. Like, you know, give me a break. So anyway, another time, we had to go parking because sometimes that's all you can do, right? So we've gone out looking for a nice quiet spot and we've gone parking. Anyway, so I've jumped over into the passenger seat and I'm sitting on his lap and I've just taken my top off and because I'm looking straight behind me and a cop car pulls up straight behind us and I'm like, oh my fuck, I was spewing, right? So I put my top back on so this copper gets out, walks over to the driver's door, sort of put, puts his hands in on the thing and sticks his head in. And he's like, and what are you two up to? And I just said straight out to him, we're trying to have sex. Like, I was absolutely peeking. Because, like, come on, like, give me a break. <laughs> anyway, this copper looks at me for, like, five seconds. And then he goes, kids at home? <laughs> it was so funny and it's like yes they're bloody everywhere and he's like ho, 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 ho. and he starts getting up from the car and he's like well have a lovely night make sure you apply the handbrake <laughs> and off he goes <laughs> wait a few seconds off he went it's like oh my god like he totally put me out of the mood for like a whole 20 seconds it was hilarious so there's a struggles okay now the probably the funniest one out of all of them all right we're going to fast forward some time until i was living here okay when i first moved in here geez rusty would have been about 10 or 11 and um so my partner would come up on weekends and come and stay for the weekends so, <laughs> okay, this one night, all right, we're in the bedroom. I thought I was being really, really quiet. Like, sometimes he'd actually have to pull the pillow over my head just to shut me up, like, oh, good old days. <laughs> anyway, I thought I was being really quiet. I was quite chuffed with it all, you know. So I get up and go and have a shower, and I'm walking out the shower, and there's Rusty standing there with his hands on his hip, 10 years old, tapping his foot, and he's just giving me the biggest dirty looks at all. And I'm like, well, what? And he goes, I've left a million dollar fine on your bed. Don't do it again. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? So I've gone into my room and on my pillow, he has written me out a one million dollar fine with don't do it again on it. <laughs> so I tried to find it, but I, oh my God, it's so hot here because I have to turn the air conditioner off because you can't hear. Um, so I put it away in a safe spot because I thought I'm pulling that out when he gets married and putting it up on the big screen. It was freaking hilarious, right? But I couldn't find it because clearly it's somewhere safe. Um, so that's, uh, that's hilarious. So there's probably way more stories and I just can't think about them. So the moral to this one story is get it in as much as you can when they're tiny and they don't know what's going on. And then after that, get a caravan in the backyard. Because <laughs> in the end, we had to like go hire a really cheap cabin for a night or you know whatever we could do like pitch a tent up somewhere for a couple of hours like it, it was absolutely nuts so yeah prepare now for some sort of a little escape for you guys when the kids get older because i'm telling you it's a pain in the friggin ass all right so we'll start the story from the beginning so i was 17 gave birth to harley fast forward five years okay he's i'm um, 22 or so and he started first year of primary school um the first day he went to school he come home that day and he said mom mom they got guitar lessons at school i really want to play guitar by this stage i'm a single mum <coughs> and back then 22 single mum with a five-year-old was really unheard of like everybody at school i thought it was all the grandparents that dropped the kids off but it wasn't i was just really young and they were all a normal age mind you i had the little 
boot tube and the and the little mini skirts and you know the boots up to your thighs and you know smoking coloured cigarettes and shit. So yeah, I stood out like dog balls, no doubt. <laughs> Anyway, so it took me about a week or so and I gathered up enough money to pay all the fees for his guitar lessons. So I paid him all and his first guitar lesson, I think it was like a Thursday night straight after school at the school with, um, with the music teacher. So anyway, I thought I'll go with him for his first lesson so that way if there's any way I, I could help at home, I would know from the lesson. So we've walked in and the guitar teacher looked at me and said, and he said, um, he goes, oh, can I help you? And I said, oh, yeah, this is Harley. He's coming for his first guitar lesson. And he looks down at Harley. And like, Harley was tiny, five-year-old. He was just tiny. And he looks down at me and goes, oh, he can't play guitar. He's too little. We don't have a guitar that size. They don't even make him that size. No, I'm sorry. He can't play. Well, anyway, if you'd know me at all, that I was freaking as spewing, mate. And I'm like, look, I've already paid the fees. Do something with him. If I can teach him something, right? He's here. Do something with him. And I'll sort it out. And he goes, oh, you won't be able to... And I said, just do something with him. So he sort of stuffed around with a bit of music and, you know, played him some tunes or whatever he did anyway. So we got home and Harley was absolutely devo, you know, because this bloke said he can't play. And I said, look, just leave it with me. Don't worry about it, all right? We'll, we'll work it out. So the next morning I took him to school and I took the bus down to the bay, also known as Glenelg. And down there, they had one of the best music shops, I think, still around to this day. So I walked into the shop. I said to the bloke, look, I've got a five-year-old son. He really wants to play guitar. The guitar teacher said he couldn't play because he's too little. Uh, is there anything we can do here? And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, look, I can make you a custom guitar for him. Uh, it's going to cost a lot of money, but I can do it. And I said, you know, well, how much are we talking about? I think he said around $400, $420 which back 30, 40 something years ago, right, was a heap of money. And I said, all right, well, let's do it. I'll come up with the money, let's do it. So I went back on the bus to school, picked him up from school, took, went back down to the bay to the music shop and uh, the guy fiddled him out, you know, just checked all his measurements and all that sort of stuff or whatever. And um, he said, oh, when's his next lesson? I said, it's next Thursday. So we had like six days. And he goes, yeah, I reckon I can do it in that time. And I said, well, what about the money? He goes, bring the money with you on the day. I said, done. So the day comes around and he says, oh, I'll be ready at about one o'clock. So I got on the bus with a mate and we went down the bay, went in there. It was absolutely beautiful. He did an absolutely freaking amazing job. I paid him the money. Um, he gave me a guitar case, a music stand, um, heaps of picks, like he, a new set of strings, like he threw in heaps of stuff for me. And for that price, I suppose you'd think fair enough, but he did, he threw it all in and, and the guitar was just beautiful, like he just did an amazing job on it. So we still had a couple of hours to go before school was finished. So I said to her, well, let's go, there was this beautiful little restaurant that you could sit outside and look over the bay. And it did the most amazing tacos and these little bottles of, I don't know what alcohol they were. You know those flask things with the cane stuff all around them or whatever? So I thought, all right, let's bugger it. Let's go sit down there, have some nachos, have a couple of cane thingies or whatever. And we'll take off. I think the bus was coming. We would have been about five minutes late for school, but that was when the next bus was coming. So so it was <clears throat> late for the lesson on I me. Mean. So anyway, we're sitting down there and we're getting half cut or whatever time comes, get on the bus, go to school. So here I am, like, my mate's out there with all the other crap and I've like slammed the door open and I've walked in, you know, like, oh, I'm here because I have to just say I was. And there's little Harley and he's just sitting there and he's just looking up at me because I was five minutes late. He didn't think I was coming or I was going to be able to do anything. And God knows what the teacher had said to him. So anyway, I walked in, he's like, he just looks up at me, and then he looks down and sees the guitar. And I'll tell you what, the look on that kid's face, I will take to the grave with me. So I've gone up to him and knelt down, and he's given me the biggest hug, and I've given him his guitar. And like, I've pulled him up by the chin, and I said to him, now you listen to me, and listen to me really well. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Because for as long as I'm your mum, you can do anything you bloody want. And I absolutely friggin' meant it. So I stood up, 
turned around to the teacher and there's a teacher with a smile on his face and a tear running down his eye. And I'm like, so you got to teach him now or what? <laughs> you know, like half cut from the mud. And he's like, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The teacher ended up being absolutely brilliant. Uh, Harley ended up being absolutely brilliant at it. And the moral to that part of the story is material things don't matter. If you can swap them for a memory or a moment like that, you do it in a heartbeat. So I think the other moral to the story is you know, we stress out too much that, you know, we don't have enough for our kids or anything. But you think about times like, say we go and get a trampoline, okay? A big ass trampoline, settle up for them for Christmas. Christmas day comes around and they will play in that huge box the trampoline come in all day long. So, you know, don't worry about it if you don't have enough money for the top shelf things and that. It really doesn't matter. It's what you do with them, the things that you do with them, the fishing trips, the, you know, I mean, I used to take Harley, we used to go to West Lakes because I was living down in Adelaide. And by then I had a car, no license, but a car. So I used to take them to West Lakes and we'd sit there fishing and get whiting all day long, you know. It cost me a couple of sandwiches and some drinks that I would take with me and a little bit of bait. And he remembers those times, you know. All right, now let's fast forward another eight years, okay. So Harley's 13. So at that time in that era, I was driving around pink. So pink is my 65 Ford Falcon XP. It's off the road now, it's absolutely totally like, it needs a lot done to it, put it that way. <laughs> but at the time, I drove around for a good 10 years or so, right? And in pink has a truck air horn. And it is really freaking loud. So I used to drop Harley off at high school at the beginning until he banned me from doing it. And I would drop him off in pink. So I would pull up to the front of the school and he'd get out. And just as he started walking away, I'd honk the truck air horn. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to embarrass the shit out of him in a hot pink car, right? Well, anyway, it backfired because apparently all the girls loved it. So, whatever. <laughs> and the other story about pink right from that era is that um, I remember Rusty's dad, he was fixing something under the bonnet. So on the old big cars, when you pull the bottle up, the latches on them and that are massive, right? Like to when you close them for the latches to go and lock these down. So anyway, the bonnet was up. You can picture this big hard latch there. And Rusty's dad's in there fixing something. Now I was in the driver's seat. I don't know, I mean, I had to bleed the brakes on that bloody thing that many times. So I'd sit there and pumping him and he'd let the air out and that sort of stuff. But this one day, I can't particularly remember what he was fixing, but he was fixing something on it anyway. And I was sitting in the driver's side and the button for the, um, for the air horn was just like saying to me, press me, press me. And I'm like, oh, 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 should I? Oh, oh, no. <laughs> I'll press it all right. And he's jumped that hard that he's cracked the top of his head on the latch thing on the bloody <laughs> and i'm laughing my ass off and next thing you know i see him coming around the side of the car he's got like a trickle of blood i mean it would have hurt but he didn't need stitches or anything and he walks around the side of the car and he's like yeah you fuck and i'm like oh gunk oink 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 right locked all the doors i was just laughing my freaking ass off mate it was hilarious to me all right, so now let's fast forward another three years until Harley was 16, okay? And that is the year I got bombarded with Commodores. Mate, there were freaking Commodores everywhere. It used to do my head in. So back then, I liked to grow herbs. We'll leave it at that, right? And anyway, I get a knock at the door, and there's a copper. And I'm like, yeah, what can I do for you? And he goes, uh, I'm looking for Harley. And I said, why? And he goes, mate, he's been doing burnouts. And I said, what? How can you prove that? And he goes, come here. <laughs> so I've walked outside. So obviously I used to crank my music all the time and that. And hearing burnouts was nothing. I lived in the middle of the powerful gardens. If you didn't hear a burnout, you'd be worried, right? So I never really thought much of it. So anyway, he's to walk me outside. So Harley the pinhead has done a, a pretty impressive burnout, no doubt. Starting at one end of the street, which is really long. He's done the burnout all the way down the street. And then the tosser did the burnout straight into the driveway. And then he's closed the gates. 
So the cobbers come along and just follow this burnout straight into my driveway. Like, who does that? Like, I mean, a full burnout straight into the driveway. Like, there was just, and I'm just like, give me your car. I'll get him to call you. <laughs> so from that day onwards, there was no more herbs. I just, it was not worth it. <laughs>